Hello. This week, I'm going to be talking about review of discretionary powers. This is a topic that we have in fact touched upon from time to time in the module today. So some of what I am going to say in this pre-recorded video will sound a little familiar, but I will be bringing some familiar issues together and hopefully presenting them in a new light, as well as presenting some new material. And as with my previous pre-recorded lectures, I will be talking about the state of the law before some of the most important recent decisions, in this case Baker, Dunsmuir and Vavilov, as well as the impact of those decisions. One reason I will do this is that, as you will see, the concerns and judicial philosophy underlying the older law has not disappeared, even if recent case law disapproves of it in certain ways. This is particularly the case when we are talking about the review of discretionary decisions. Interpretative frames that would appear to have been superseded have a tendency to reappear in new guises, as we will see. It remains to be seen whether the reconsideration of the framework of substantive review in Vavilov will put an end to this, and this is something we will touch on in this mini-lecture as well as in the next. As you should already know, the review of discretionary decisions was once upon a time undertaken within its own conceptual framework. However, the case of Baker, which you have read, subsumed the review of discretionary decisions within the pragmatic and functional analysis, which after being simplified and renamed the standard of review analysis in Dunsmuir, was replaced by a presumptions-based approach in Vavilov. So we need to consider how Dunsmuir and Vavilov might have impacted on the review of discretionary decisions. We will get to that, but first I want to look quite briefly at some conceptual issues in relation to discretionary powers and consider some of the older law. This older law, incidentally, still bears more than a passing resemblance to English administrative law, and I will draw on some parallels and some cases from English administrative law in explaining things. So first, let me turn to some of the ideas I introduced right at the beginning of this module when I talked about the growth of the administrative state. If you remember, I talked about Oliver McDonough's pattern of government growth and the realisation on the part of government that certain problems could not be solved on a once and for all basis. They required administrators to be able to react to the changing environment, and this in turn required that they should be given discretionary powers. Dicey and thought, which was inimically opposed to discretionary powers, had no answer to this. All Dicey and his followers could do, and even then could only do for so long, was to try to hold back the tide. That is to say, they could oppose the growth of the administrative state, but the electorate demanded that social problems should be actively managed, and elected governments were prepared to attempt to do so on their behalf. So the question that administrative lawyers began to ask is, if we are going to have these discretionary powers, how should the law think about them? At first, the courts tried to fit them within the conceptual framework of the ultra vires principle. So the courts would ask whether the administrative body did in fact enjoy the discretionary power to take the decision it was claiming to make. This way of thinking about discretion still has a strong hold on the way administrative lawyers think, but it has proved inadequate to the task and it has to be built upon and modified. One of the problems was that when the court wanted to intervene, it could do so basing its case for intervention on an argument about the meaning of the statute that could be spurious. But equally, once a court had determined that a particular decision was within the scope of the discretion of an administrative body, there was nothing that the court could do, however unjust or re unreasonable the decision might be in fact. So really, the question for administrative lawyers was, how can we render discretionary decisions legible to law so that the courts can play a reviewing function, 
in a way that was capable of policing the substance of the exercise of discretionary powers, as well as policing their boundaries. In other words, the courts had to be aware of the benefits of discretionary administration, as well as being alert to the possibility of abuse. So the courts, in England as well as in Canada, attempted to develop legal doctrines that tried to deal with that problem. In my lectures for week one, I mentioned the English case of Padfield and Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. I noted that the core idea of Padfield, that where discretionary powers are conferred by statute, those exercising them must not only act intra virus, but must exercise them in pursuit of the object and purposes of the statute as read as a whole. In other words, it was not sufficient that a body acted intra virus, it must also act for a proper purpose. And as I said at the time, in fact, this development of English law was anticipated by developments in Canada. Specifically, the case of Ron Carelli and De Plessis, 1959. In that case, the Premier of Quebec, Maurice Du Plessis, had instructed the Liquor Licensing Commission to revoke the restaurant license held by Ron Carelli. The reason for his instruction was that Ron Carelli had supported Jehovah's Witnesses by posting the bail bonds for members of the sect who were arrested for distributing their religious pamphlets. The statute contained an open-ended power of revocation. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court of Canada held that this was a misuse of statutory power. As Justice Rand put it, the grounds for refusing or cancelling a permit should unquestionably be such and such only, as are compatible with the purposes envisaged by the statute. As to what these purposes were, Justice Rand went on, there is always a perspective within which a statute is intended to operate, and any clear departure from its lines or objects is just as objectionable as fraud or corruption. So fairly strong words about acting for an improper purpose. So what you can see in Ron Carelli is that there are many grounds on which an alcohol license might properly be revoked. And often these would be too subtle to set out in statute. There might be problems with late night revelry disturbing residents or any number of things that liquor licensing might have to keep on top of in response to changing patterns like social drinking habits and the like. But it was arbitrary and oppressive to use this administrative power to try and prevent Ron Carelli from providing bail money for Jehovah's Witnesses. Other improper uses of discretion articulated by the courts in this early era including acting in bad faith, wrongful delegation, which might occur where a board in whom power was vested passed the decision on to a local manager, fettering a discretion by laying down a rigid rule, or acting under the dictation of another. I will talk a little further about these principles of administrative law in a second video for this week. But to return to thinking about the enterprise of making discretionary power legible to the law, this was not just a matter of the courts developing appropriate legal doctrines. Legislatures and administrative bodies had to play their part too in making discretionary powers reviewable. In a hugely influential 1969 book called Discretionary Justice, US administrative lawyer Kenneth Culp Davis argued that the existence of discretionary powers was not antithetical to administrative justice. But discretionary powers, in order to be exercised justly, must be confined, structured and checked. Confining for Davis meant that there had to be limits on the existence of discretionary powers, that such powers should be no more widely drawn than need be, if you like. In addition, they should be structured through such devices as plans, policy statements and rules, as well as open findings, open rules and open precedents. And by checking, Davis meant both that the court should have a role in review of administrative decisions and that there should be layers of internal bureaucratic checking and review 
By such devices, Davis argued, discretionary powers could coexist with administrative justice. So to sum up this introductory part of my lecture, what I think we can see is a gradual acceptance amongst courts, legislatures, and in administrative law writing more generally, that the existence of discretionary powers was not in itself something to be feared or resisted. But at the same time, even though the vesting of broad discretionary powers in administrative agencies was not itself problematic, that there was potential for abuse. And just policing the outer boundaries of administrative power was not sufficient. There needed to be some kind of supervision, even of the exercise of powers that were within these boundaries. And this is something that the courts tried to do in crafting the doctrine of improper purpose, as in the case of Ron Carelli. But this was also something legislators tried to do in drafting statutes so as to confine, structure and check administrative discretion, even while encouraging and supporting its exercise. So the question persisted as to the legal framework in which discretionary decisions should be reviewed. And the principles that I have talked about already, taking count of irrelevant considerations or acting for an improper purpose, proceeded from a particular view of the relationship between discretion and law. This view is beautifully captured by the legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin, who sees it as being like the relationship between the donut and the hole. Discretion, like the hole in a donut, he says in his 1978 works, taking the right seriously, does not exist except as an area left open by a surrounding belt of restriction. He goes on, it is therefore a relative concept. It always makes sense to ask, discretion under which standards, or discretion as to which authority? This is a compelling metaphor, but it does not advance us much beyond the idea that the review of discretionary decisions is about identifying the boundaries of discretion, the limits of the surrounding belt, as Dworkin puts it. And this brings us to the case of Baker and why I think it is such an important and visionary case. In Baker, the court subsumed the review of discretionary decisions within the same pragmatic and functional approach as it took to the review of agency decisions on matters of law. Post Baker, the fact that a statute conferred a broad discretion on a decision maker was a factor to be taken into account in the standard of review analysis, one which indicated deference, perhaps extreme deference, was due to the decision maker. Here's what the court in the judgment of Justice Leroux Dubay said about discretionary decisions in paragraph 54. It is, however, inaccurate to speak of a rigid dichotomy of discretionary or non-discretionary decisions. Most administrative decisions involve the exercise of implicit discretion in relation to many aspects of decision making. As I said in a previous lecture, we can adapt Dworkin's metaphor, if we like, to say that rather than thinking of administrative discretion as the hole in the donut, we could see administrative law as a door of varying density. This perspective on administrative discretion fits well with the unified approach to review of substance laid out in Baker by Madame Justice Leroux Dubé. As she says further at paragraph 56 of Baker, the pragmatic and functional approach can take into account the fact that the more discretion that is left to the decision maker, the more reluctant courts should be to interfere with the manner in which discretionary decision makers have made choices amongst various options. However, though discretionary decisions will generally be given considerable respect, that discretion must be exercised in accordance with the boundaries imposed by statute, the principles of the rule of law, the principles of administrative law, the fundamental values of Canadian society, and the principles of the Charter. So discretionary decisions, in my adaptation of Dworkin's metaphor, in areas where the dough was at its fluffiest, were overlaid with the controls of administrative law, 
albeit more lightly so than decisions subject to denser forms of legal regulation in other areas. Now, it won't have escaped your notice that if discretionary decisions were, as a result of Baker, brought within the pragmatic and functional approach to reasonableness review, then they were also subject to the changes to Canadian administrative law that were wrought by Dunsmuir and Vavilov. So let's take another look at those cases, focusing on what they have to say about discretionary powers. The key point on discretion is dealt with rather briefly in Dunsmuir. At paragraph 53, the majority states, where the question is one of fact, discretion or policy, deference will usually apply automatically. We believe the same standard must apply to the review of questions where the legal and factual issues are intertwined with and cannot be readily separated. So post Dunsmuir, the standard of review in the case of discretionary decisions is almost certainly always the reasonableness standard. Now with Vafilov and the presumption-based approach, discretionary decisions like decisions on point of law benefit from the presumption of a reasonableness standard. Similarly, the presumption of reasonableness can be rebutted by the same Vavilov criteria, where the legislator indicates that a correctness standard should pertain, and when the rule of law requires it. For the purpose of this mini-lecture, I would like to draw attention to just one further way in which Dunsmuir and Vavilov touch on discretionary decision-making. This is the emphasis that the majorities in those decisions placed on a reasonable decision being one that is transparent, justified and intelligible. So the important point is that even in the exercise of discretionary powers, administrative agencies are being held to a high standard in terms of giving justification for their decisions. And there is one aspect of the Vavilov guidance in conducting reasonableness review that should be emphasised in particular. The majority states that a reasonable decision is one which is justified in the light of the legal and factual constraints that bear upon the decision. And they list a number of elements that, as the majority put it, will generally be relevant in evaluating whether a given decision is reasonable. The first one of these is the governing statutory scheme, and you could read what the majority has to say at paragraphs 108 to 110 of Vavilov. And under this heading, the majority discusses the situation where discretionary power is vested in an administrative decision maker. Quoting the case of Catalyst, the majority states that while an administrative body may have considerable discretion in making a particular decision, that decision must ultimately comply with the rationale and purview of the statutory scheme under which it is adopted. And it also quotes Roncarelli in support of this idea. Now what follows from this, I think, is that a lot of older case law on review of discretionary decisions has not lost its relevance. Rather, considerations like statutory purpose, wrongful delegation and fettering of discretion are folded into analysis of the legal and factual constraints that bear upon a decision and subject to reasonableness review. So it is still necessary to consider some of these older principles and to think through how they might be reflected in the Vavilov guidance on conducting reasonableness review. I will talk about these principles in more detail in my next mini-lecture. For now, goodbye.